everybody, listeners, we're in for a treat here because I'm talking to Jason Bowman here on the Pro Marketer Podcast, where we talk about smart marketing for accounting and tax practitioners. Everything beyond marketing is eligible for conversation. The reason why you're in for a treat here is because my guest, Jason Bowman, EA, has been around the block and is one of my favorite co-hosts when we're, I've done webinars to the industry. We've been on, I've been on his podcast multiple times. I've spoken on the same stage with this man. I have had beers with him multiple times after events. Really one of the most fascinating people in the industry, in my view. He is, uh, has, was a like uh, amateur figure skater, has been homeless. He, I mean, what? there's so many interesting things about your bio. You used to go to Burning Man. I mean, he's so interesting, guys. And on top of that, He's been around the block. He's one of the most respected, widely followed voices in the industry on a variety of topics. He's known for putting out like detailed content on a variety of topics. He's got a new book, Profit Optimizers, 12 Big Ideas for a More Profitable Tax Firm that I'm excited for you. Oh, oh look at that. He's even got it up on the screen. Um, he's a little dorky. He's a little nerdy. And that's like my favorite thing about him because I just, oh, man, you're just, is so well read and interesting. I'm going to shut up with uh, superlatives and just let you experience the Jason Bowman experiment experience. So let's dive in because you you've also I mean you've been, had your hand in different CPE ventures. You've sold businesses. Again, you were homeless 12 years ago or something like that. Give a brief snapshot of your bio before we dive into what to, to the stuff in your new book, if you would, with whatever you're comfortable sharing related to the various things that you've put your hand to? So I was a real estate investor and real estate agent back before the economy collapsed. Before the, before the first crash. Before, yeah, before or the not the first crash. crash. Yeah. It, yeah. First crash in memory. Yeah. In recent the dot, after the dot-com crash, the Goldman Sachs crash. <laughs> Correct. Correct. Yeah. So yeah. What's a better up, term for that crash? It's the, not the Goldman the, Sachs crash. No, it's they call the, it the uh, great financial crisis. The great, okay. Is that what people say? The, the great GFC. Financial crisis? Yeah. The I mean, I remember it. Crisis. I remember seeing George Bush talking about the collapse of Lehman Brothers and blah, yes. blah, blah. Yeah, um, that, that one. The Lehman Brothers is probably the better yes. way to put it. Everyone yes. knows the Lehman Brothers. Okay. All right. Shut so, up, mate. Carry on. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I was a real estate investor, real estate agent back then. Lost everything in the 08 crash. Ended up in chapter seven bankruptcy and- Lived in a van by the river. Living living in a van down by Boulder Creek. It was a creek, not a river. <laughs> okay. But yeah, literally ended up homeless. Needed a job. And so a friend of mine had just started working at a little tax resolution firm. And I didn't even know what tax resolution is. Went in, applied for a job. And, you know, they hired me as a $10 an hour admin assistant. Hmm. And then long story short, six months later, I was That's an operation. Sexy, sexy. Well, oh, I know, right, yeah. right. They got sexier six months later when I moved into an ops manager and marketing role. And then over the ensuing 17 months, I helped take that firm from about 750,000 a year to about 3.3 million a year in revenue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In less than a year and a half, we went from six employees to 40. Amazing. Uh, so very rapid growth. And then I left and uh, started my own firm. Yep. Uh, being entrepreneurially minded, that was always going to be part of the process. So during that time, I got my EA license, went off, started my own firm, represented clients directly uh, for a total, um, including employee and employer time mm -hmm. um, for eight years. And, and you co-led the Tax Resolution Academy, which is correct. still going and thriving um, yes. with Dan Hen, which is, I, you know, I need to get him on the podcast here soon because he's got a lot to say about well, yeah, that. You know, it was, well. you know, that's honestly running the tax resolution Academy with Dan is one of the highlights of my career. We helped mm -hmm. 20,000 EAs and CPAs and tax attorneys to add tax resolution onto their practice. Mm -hmm. Like, it, which are, it, it, can we talk about this still? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, the, the, yeah, yeah. the landscape of the tax resolution world oh, right oh, now yeah sure you know um, it's there are so you know what? i'm many... going to save that conversation for dan because okay. he's in the trenches right now on I, that. I just want to say though there's so many fly-by-night operators in the mm -hmm. tax resolution world that i'm proud of the fact that i helped create competition for those fly-by-night companies <laughs> and to help 
you know, the independent practitioners to add right. this revenue source and to go help people legitimately. I'm so proud of yeah. having been part of that. And Dan yeah. is continuing the tradition right now. And so, yeah, yeah just really- We don't need to name them. them. That's fine. Yeah, um, correct. Correct. No, totally. All right. So since then, you also started, helped start this CPE company. Do you want to talk about that or no? Well, so Pro, uh, you're talking about Prolera? Yeah. So Prolera is a software company, started that in 2015. I no longer, quote, work there. Um, right. I haven't for a few years, but right. still a board member. Sure. Know, still involved a little bit. And really what that was all about was providing a learning management system platform to larger public accounting and law firms to manage their in-house training. Right. Micro CPE. Uh, yeah, that's where we started was with uh, nano learning. Okay. Um, That's which, what you call it. Sorry. Nano learning. Yeah. Which, you know, it's funny. And it was this big thing that was going to be the next big thing in CPE, like Not really. six, seven years ago. Yeah. And it just kind of hasn't taken off. Yeah. But, and so, you know, as a software company, as a tech startup, you have to pivot where the market is going. Mm -hmm. And so more than anything, we became kind of a vertical integrator between human resources, talent management systems. Mm-hmm. And applying continuing education tracking into the HR systems. Yeah, right. So for large um, firms, that's a big deal. Um, right. so, and that, that was your client base was these large Correct. firms. Right. Correct. So, so different world than dealing Very. with sort of the micro practice world that you right. and I, excuse me, you and I have been swimming in for 20 years or I have been for 20 years, you for 13 or whatever. All right. So now you're sort of like semi-retired living the writing life, you know, kind of like you get to choose your projects. And for some reason, one of your projects was writing this book. Yes. And it's great. So tell me about the book. And, you know, so 12 big ideas for a more profitable tax firm. Right. You know, the big idea haha, behind this book is really to summarize in very short form, and it's only 160 something pages, the lessons that I learned both as a firm operator and also working with hundreds of firms over the years as a consultant. Mm -hmm. And the main observations about the difference between the truly profitable small firms and the ones that don't right. produce as much income for their owners as the owner would like. You know, there's not a lot of things in terms of the actions that they do that separate the most profitable tax practices from the ones that aren't quite as profitable, right? It's doing a small number of things. Now, are there more than 12 of them? Yes. I, I could have easily added six or 10 more, right? right? But 12 was a good number because practitioners, solos, or, you know, three, four, five staff, they're running a business, right? right. They don't have like a dedicated person to doing business development and business optimization. And so the firm owner is doing that. And I think it was, it's best for them to tackle such things in bite-sized chunks, mm -hmm. right? And so with 12, that obviously le lends itself to doing one a month. And you focus on this one big idea for the month. You make some small improvements that drive profitability in one area. And then the next month you move on to the next one. Okay. So Give me and some chapter headings. Give me some chapter headings. Like what oh, are, you're, what are you're some of these? Open the book here. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to make you do some work, brother. All right. So big idea. Number one, there's only three ways to increase revenue, mm. right? You can get I more know clients. What those are. Yep. Yep. Yeah. We, you know, these, you get we talk about clients, them all the time. Yeah. You, char you charge each client more, um, or you sell more services, right. right? So for tax practitioners, the most obvious example of that is to go from just doing tax preparation to, to also doing tax planning right. and tax resolution right, and then getting into advisory services. Which in right. my opinion, if people are not doing this right now, they're going to die in five to 10 years. Correct. Correct. Um, so for sure. Correct. I've, you know, I've kind of come up, come down off my high horse here in, in my retirement years now about, you know, the rise of AI and robotic process automation. But the reality is those things are still, they're, they're not just coming, they're already here. Right. The seasonal tax business will still work. There will be short form warriors out there um, for a long time when they've got some other things in place, uh, like good ops, good team. They're able to keep their margins, you know, healthy while charging medium range pricing, like 
H&R Block level pricing, right. that will still be there because there will be a middle income taxpayer market Correct. for that. The people who don't want to deal with TurboTax and Tax Act and whatever, that's going to be there. But, you know, there's going to be a ceiling on that kind of business um, in a different it's a way. It's a big that, bot too. Yeah, it's true. And I think there's a lot of people who have that kind of business that are going to struggle if they don't have those things in place, you know, the good SOPs, the good, yep. what have you. So yes. So yeah, I agree with you. I mean, I'm less on my high horse about that. Like you, I don't want to be such a prophet of doom against those, even though that's the, that's the world that I came from, mm -hmm. you know, that seasonal tax business world, there is a place for it, but, there but there's a big, but I've been around the block and in the industry and you have too for long enough to see way healthier um, margins, way like higher ceiling practices that have tax planning, have tax resolution, have yeah. um, financial planning, um, yeah. and are more of a multi-service year-round firm. Now, some right. people don't want to hear that because they like their six-month vacation, quote unquote. You know what? It, which is fine. Nothing wrong with that. If you're generating enough income to feed yourself and pay the rent and pay your staff, put food on the table, all that. I, it, totally fine if you want to work six months, take six yep. months off. Yep. Like as somebody who used to do that with his tax resolution practice, working it's kind of awesome. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. It's kind of I, awesome. Yeah. I will not say anything about that. But if you're the kind of person that wants to build more wealth, if you want the cash flow to be able to do other things like start other companies yep. or to you know, buy rental properties or anything like that, you have to increase your revenues, which increases your bottom line. And by the way, that feeds into big idea number two, which is to raise your fees. Yep. I know you've experienced this in the practitioners you speak with Yep. is a lot of tax pros don't charge what they're worth. They I literally charge. just had lunch with an entrepreneur friend of mine who runs a design agency and he pays his tax person $300 a month. And I'm like, man, and he can't really get to him. The guy's overworked. The guy is like, is, he schedules three weeks out to have a conversation with his clients, which I'm fine with scheduling, you know, that kind of thing. But like, man, you got to do numbers at that level of pricing. You've got to, yes. I mean, a, a real business has got, you've got to have like, what, hundreds and hundreds of clients to make that healthy. And, you know, ha, huh, it's not an amazing model in my opinion. And that includes tax prep. It's not a, um, anyway, well, like and that's just one example. Yeah. And that, that also feeds into big idea number three, which is choose thy clients wisely. Right. You know, I just had a customer uh, a couple of days ago. He posted a really good question to me. He's got all this work coming in between now and the extension deadline, mm -hmm. you know? And he's like, okay, between now and September 15th and October 15th, like different people have different needs and trying to get things in. Like, how do I prioritize who gets their stuff done first? Because I don't think I can get to everybody. Mm. And some people probably aren't going to like my answer because this is the I know greedy, you're saying. the greedy capitalist answer, right? Revenue. But it's who's going to pay you the most, yeah, right? That is one. So fee level is one way of filtering your good clients from your not so good clients, and it's perfectly okay to fire clients. Yep. You know, and client, even to raise prices on existing clients. Correct. Correct. Yep. Yeah. And, you know, so what's this, you know, what's the saying? Those who try to be all things to all people end up being nothing to anybody or something like right. that. Yep. You know, so your business should specialize. Yep. There's absolutely nothing wrong with becoming the go-to person serving medical offices. Oh, absolutely. Yep. And you do all financial and tax stuff for medical offices. To well, the you can exclusion charge of like everybody a specialist. Else. You can charge like a specialist, uh, you know, and Correct. you can schedule like a specialist and you can do the three weeks out but like the client is happier about it because you know they're with the the firm that is working with their people right Correct. so and you and build you industry what? knowledge whatever well, oh it's huge for yeah. uh sops like you mentioned earlier mm -hmm. right so like well, a tax pro, pro yeah. marketer you uh, guys do marketing you're a marketing agency for tax firms yep 
you're not a marketing agency for real estate barber shops, yep. barber shops or car dealerships. Yep. Why? Because by staying in one lane, you develop special industry knowledge, you develop standard operating procedures. There's different tweaky, nerdy things that you guys do for SEO mm -hmm. and running ads, writing ad copy. Right. It doesn't apply to other industries. And so agencies, regular agencies couldn't do what we do because, Correct. because of that. Right? right. And so, yeah. And we, we hear, so we filter our clients, you know, and Absolutely. Um, one of the things we've pushed for, for our CPA firm, you know, tax practitioner and accounting practitioner clients, um, is the filter thing that we've put into place in the last couple of years, where instead of just downloading the white paper and any, just an email address and just sort of, you know, have hammer away and take all comers, we're moving to surveys and the Ryan Levesque ask methodology mm -hmm. and making sure that that is a primary part of all of what we do online so that it feeds the right kinds of people. So you have information on revenue, have information on like previous tax return data, which all happens in the discovery process in an initial consultation, but wouldn't it be great to have that info beforehand? So you're not like budgeting a 60 minute meeting. And it turns out this is a, you know, a $70,000 a year business that your business owner that you're engaging with. And it's sort of like they can barely pay their bills and, you know, or like a $2 million company that won't blink an eye to spend 2000 a month on advisory services. Right. So. It's a whole different kind of thing, which by the way, is what I pay my advisor. <laughs> let me give you a, let me give you your listeners a mental paradigm shift. Okay. And it relates to exactly what you just said. When a lot of tax professionals meet with somebody, they don't know yet whether that person is going to be a good client for them. Okay. That's what they, that's the purpose of the initial consultation. But let's change the paradigm. Instead of putting that 45 minutes to an hour into that initial consultation, what if instead you had a process in place to determine whether or not that prospect was qualified to do yeah. business with you yeah. before you ever even talk to them? Yep. That would change the game. Changes the game. And that's exactly yeah. what you, you were just talking about. But I think that practitioners need to visualize the change in process. They can see like a, a funnel diagram, right? right? And like from click funnels or something like that, they always publish those diagrams, right? About the, right. the building blocks for the funnels. Yeah. So looking at it from that perspective, change the process, eliminate that one hour, pre-qualify your prospects. And then if they're not, and I don't care if you're doing tax prep, tax planning, tax resolution, any of it, mm -hmm. pre-qualify everybody yep. before you actually meet with them. And then if they're not a good candidate for you, politely brush them off. Okay. Well, let and me press you on this. What if, what would you say to, cause look, I've been banging this drum for years. And one of the things that we run up against with our clients is they've got a book of business of clients mm -hmm. that they love, right. right. Or that they've served for 20 years. Right. And it's like the, mom and pop down the road, it's the minister, it's the whomever that pays them 300 a year to do their tax return. And they just don't want to let that poor mom and pop down. Sure. Now, what would you say to somebody who's got like mm, three or 400 clients mm -hmm. and a significant number of them are in that kind of category? Mm -hmm. Like they're loyal to their client. They care, mm -hmm. right? And that's yeah. good. I actually want to work with practitioners who have people in their ranks that they serve like that. But like, how do these two come together? So there's two ways I look at that. So I have an answer. I want to hear your answer. So there's two ways I think to approach that. One is that a practitioner makes a decision that they are going to transition their firm and their, what their clientele looks like over a two to five year period. And during that transition period, you service those clients, but you let them know that eventually they're going to go away. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. That is one approach. Two or three, okay. trans two or three year transition. Okay. Right. So you're not yep. just cutting them off at the knees right. and kicking them to the curb. Okay. Yep. 
It's good. Okay. That's one approach. Another approach, and it's probably the preferred approach for an entrepreneurially minded accountant is you go, okay, I have these three or 400 clients that are my loyal clients. They help me grow. I respect them. I value them because they got me where I am today. Okay. But I want to grow my business. So if I want to do that, I cannot myself as the CPA or EA, I can't myself personally service these folks anymore. And so what you do is you hire somebody and you run basically a business within your business mm -hmm. and you keep these three or 400 clients, but you hire staff, you add automation technology, you, maybe you outsource the tax prep. Maybe you go to a shore prep or something like that mm -hmm. to outsource the actual tax prep and you pay the money to have somebody else do the tax prep, whether it's in-house or external. And then you're you, you still have a transition plan. So maybe the first year you're not doing the data entry anymore. You have a, uh, you hire someone to do that, but then you still meet with the client, do the review and press the e-file button. Then you have a conversation with the client. Look, you know, over the next couple of years, you're going to be working more and more with Sarah or John or whatever. Right. And you make that transition. So maybe year one, you get rid of the data entry part and you outsource that or insource it. Mm -hmm. Then year two, you take it a step further and it's, you're not even doing the return review anymore. Maybe you just have a 10 minute meeting with the client. You go over everything, see if they have any needs, see how their experience was. Year three, they don't talk to you at all. It's yep. all handled by your staff. Yep. Okay. No, I love that. The other idea is if there's what I would have said, but I think I like your idea even better. But what I would have said is like, Go find a bunch of other clients that you can price appropriately and just choose the ones that you're personally connected to that you want to serve mm -hmm. and keep that pricing low. It's almost treated like pro bono and just put it in that category in your mind. Like if you have a heart to just like care for these people, because, right. you know, I like we all need to like I have a few clients here at Tax Pro Marketer, like just, you know, I've been doing this for 15, 16 years, like people in my church who are CPAs who are just starting out. And we give them real, like I've helped a, a couple of these guys get, build massive companies, but I was charging them like pittance compared to what I would others just cause I, but I knew I had it in that category and it was like a sort of mm -hmm. almost a charitable contribution in my mind mm -hmm. uh, to provide that. So that's that kind of approach, but it's very small numbers, right? right. So, you know. Yeah. I like your approach better because it takes care of the people longer term because, you know, and eventually these folks, they all grew because that's what we do. And they started paying our regular fees, you know, after a couple of years, but I don't know. All right, let's go through your book. I like this. This is fun. So, um, well, you know, I kind of wanted to go back to this, you know, the ask method approach um, uh -huh. and skip a few of my big ideas and go down to number eight. Okay. All um, right. Because this is, this is a spicy one for me. Right. I, and I knew it would be. And I, I mean, I even thought about that when I wrote the book. I'm like, mm, <laughs> it's going to have some issues with some of this. No, I'm not. I love this. I just don't do it for people. And okay. I, you know, I used to. And I, I um, did. yeah, and I don't anymore. And there's a variety of reasons why that's the case. I, you know, but people don't know what we're talking about. So yeah, let me explain. The, the, let me explain. The chapter of your book is called The Internet is Not Special. Yes. Uh, and you're talking about offline marketing. Well, there's two components to this idea. Okay, okay. bring on. The internet is not special. What do I mean by that? Two, so first of all, the internet is just another marketing medium. Okay, just like <laughs> this radio. is reminding me of that old like viral video from like Katie Kirk and the Today Show. You remember that? What is the internet? Yes. <laughs> In the yeah. 90s. <laughs> the information superhighway. Yes. Yeah. So it's... From a marketing perspective, it's no different than TV, radio, print, any other marketing media, okay? There are fundamental marketing things that apply to every marketing media, okay? And not to roll into a Dan Kennedy a knockoff lecture, but, you know, you still have to have your market to message match, right? Oh, yeah you still need to use the appropriate media for the target market you're trying to reach. It right. may or may not be the internet. 
Okay. Right. And even on the internet, it will be specific sub places of the internet. Right. And so the um, only place that I push back on you on this. Okay. Is that the, the internet, the information superhighway has a particular architecture and the algorithms that are so dominant now. And the, the way that Google and the social media companies and all these other large internet behemoths have organized the internet. <laughs> I like calling it that. I always just say the online world, but the internets, the webs is so algorithmically oriented that like, you've got to build with the right architecture there sure. and you can cover over a lot of market message, media match sins by just pulling a lot of the right levers and getting like client reviews and pumping your Google business profile and SEOing your site. Now that can get you to the top of search engines. So traffic comes, but then there's a question of like, okay, the next stage is you've got to have the right messaging right. for your you, traffic. You need the right and sales copy. You really right. need the right lead magnet. No, and that's where all I agree. All those things that are not specific to right. the internet. Right. It's all marketing. Right. Okay. Now, but the actually you, how to do it though, the architecture is just a little different. They're sure. like pumping Absolutely. out, you know, buying a list, pumping Absolutely. out 20,000 postcards, you know? Absolutely. The other piece of this paradigm, I'm going to use the word paradigm 50 times today. The other piece of this paradigm shift is that even though the internet is this big thing that's a presence in all of our lives, doesn't mean that all the other offline marketing stuff doesn't exist. Right. Okay? There are countless studies from the marketing world, academic studies and industry studies that clearly show that direct mail is working better today than it was 20 years ago because there's less competition in the mailbox. That's right. For okay. sure. There's ample evidence showing that even during the pandemic, something like 80 something percent of retail sales conducted during the last couple of years were still brick and mortar, not e-commerce. 80% okay. of statistics are made up, but yeah. That's true. The look at certain demographics that you might want to market to. You're going to, it's going to be more effective to reach them even more cost effective to reach them offline, depending on who they are. Mm -hmm. Right. And there are accounting firms that they don't do internet marketing. They oh, exist. Yeah. Sure. And, and they're making plenty of cash. Sure. Okay. Or sure. It's all about being in the right place to reach your specific target market. Yeah. And the internet may not be it. Did you know this is, looking at a parallel industry, okay? Financial planning. Oh, well, that's different in some ways, but go on. In some ways, okay? FINRA, but yeah. Most of it, we're talking typically a slightly older audience, okay? Right, second halfers. <laughs> yes, the classic financial planner dinner seminar. Okay? Oh, it kills. It, it still kills it in slays. 2022. It slays, yes. Yeah. Right. It's, yeah. and it's been the number one driver of variable annuity sales, regardless yeah. of what you think about variable annuities. I know I just probably caused a lot of people to, uh. but it's the number one driver of variable annuity sales. And it is an, a very, very effective um, sales strategy for estate planning for attorneys for and sure. financial planning for financial advisors. The, is problem, that the problem that a lot of CPAs and practitioners have in this, again, speaking as somebody who knows tens of thousands of these folks, right. you know, we have an email list of 28,000, whatever. And I'm exaggerating when I say I know tens of thousands, I know probably a thousand tax practitioners in some sort of like friendly way. A lot of us aren't comfortable putting on seminars, sure, right? Sure, sure, um, sure. And, you know, we can pull together methodology or messaging, but if it's a simple compliance business, you know, the ROI on it is going to be a little different, but if they're talking tax planning and we're talking like higher level services with higher fees, there for sure is a use case. I'll, for... I'll tell you over, over in the resolution side, yeah, the tiny number of practitioners that are willing to get up on a stage. Okay. And the ones that I've helped over the past few years develop their presentation skills and develop their actual presentation, the mm -hmm. ones that are able to get over that fear of public speaking, they're freaking crushing it. I bet. I bet. 
Okay, but you're right. It's a small number that are willing to go do that. Well, and also because they just have their fee model set up differently, right? So, Correct. and the financial planners, a lot of these guys are like salesmen at the core. Absolutely. And they've just attached a series seven to their repertoire and, you know, whatever. I'm sure they get, the good ones get a lot deeper than that, but, but. How many professions yeah. can we offend in one podcast? Oh, this is my favorite. I love <laughs> it. No, I'm sure there's people mad at me right now. Bring it on. I like it. But, but the, um, the point, the, the point of that example though, is that it's a completely offline strategy that works. Yes. And when a tax practitioner, an accountant is thinking about how they're going to reach their target market, you've got to think about the right modality, the right channel for reaching them. Totally. And it may not be online, totally. much to your chagrin. No, you no, I agree, agencies. man. I mean, we're here to serve the ones that actually want to build a long-term kind of like footprint in right. the online space, knowing where things are going, but that's not the only way to fly. And what you're advocating is, you know, unfortunately, like with offline marketing, like it, it is more of a rental kind of thing in terms of like, kind of. In the sense that like, if you build an online marketing platform, this is self-promotional, but I've also seen this <laughs> at play, right? When you build an effective website combined with a Google business profile, you've got an email marketing strategy in place that's cranking. You've got a social media profile that's just there and full and like available. And regardless of the virality of it, it's there and it's like, you know, legit. And you've got an advertising strategy that also gets you an ROI. That kind of thing, once you build your dominant footprint, it's harder to dislodge. Um, mm -hmm. If you just keep that little machine going at a lower cost than if you are cranking out, you know, 5,000 postcards a month, what have you. Now, you know, th there's now, lots, of, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just saying it's not a long-term strategy, perhaps. I agree with you, absolutely. The one piece of pushback that I'll give you on that has to do with speed to market. There you go. No, and that's what we do with pay-per-click because with pay-per-click advertising, it's a similar kind of thing. And so we have a variety of clients that don't do pay-per-click mm -hmm. and a bunch who do. The ones who do, like they can get, we can get ads going live and they can get leads the next day or the day of. Right. Um, same deal with postcard or whatever kind of offline direct mail advertising, you know, in non-internet, Space well, and there. you can turn it on and off at will. Right, right. That's what I really like about it. So if somebody comes and says, hey, I want to start doing tax planning. I have a $20,000 budget. I want my first appointment, you know, my first consultation appointment in two days. Go. <laughs> like, how do you make that happen? So offline, I know how to make that happen. Yeah. Online, ah, man, yeah. I mean, there's ways to make it happen, like you said, with the paid advertising, but man... Yeah. There's a lot of technology set up. Right. No. And the back end of Google, if you're not familiar with it, is right. it's like a casino. Like, yes. You're, you're, yes. You know, it's everything is favors the house. So, yes. Whereas, you know, we can get a radio ad campaign going like literally because yeah, the radio stations will produce it for you. And well, right. Well, and, you know, something like iHeartRadio, they have a website where you can buy their, their unsold ad inventory at a discount, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so if you really wanted to get up and run and boom, you can do it today. Yeah. Yep. You know, as long as you got one of these a microphone and you've got good copy and you just want to make the phone ring, no website yep. involved. You just want to make the phone ring. Yeah. You can start your radio campaign in like two hours. Yeah, it's true. And just go. It's right? true. No, I like this. I mean, we like just this isn't about us. It is my podcast though. So I am going to um, <laughs> talk about it briefly. That is that like, I believe that what we do is you know, we have tons of clients where that's all they do, but we also have a lot of clients that they do a bunch of other stuff too, you know, where they are doing the postcard mailings, they're doing the networking, they're doing some outbound cold calling within their market area or their niche. They're doing a variety of sort of like be, you know, beat the pavement, guerrilla marketing style mm -hmm. things and offline things, and they grow faster. Yes. Because as Dan Kennedy said, I don't know one way to get 50 clients, but I know 50 ways to get one and I do them all. And I love that methodology. So, you know, we can cover like 20 of those ways on behalf of people, but there's, a, there's 30 others. So, right. you know, you're not like blowing my hair back, even though the argument is fun. 
Well, and then, so, and then the other piece of it is that the core marketing concepts that drive effective, mar- you know, right audience, right message, good copy, having yeah. a good offer, like those things still apply. You can't just ignore them because you it's cannot the ignore them, cannot ignore them. Yeah. And a big thing I talk about in this, in that chapter of the book has to do with content marketing. Like, and this is something I get a lot of pushback from practitioners about is they have to develop a good content marketing strategy. Well, that's what we do. Uh, exactly. That's why I bring it up. Yep. Well, thank you. Yeah. See, I see. I can, I can tee you up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so it's, you know, practitioners don't, I, well, I think that, uh, I don't know what it is, but a lot of practitioners don't. Well, it's hard work to write a bunch of crap. Well, I think it's also maybe a lot of folks don't make the connection yeah. between the inputs and the outputs. That's right. They That's just true. see, you want me to write a blog post every week and yep. it takes me half an hour and I'm yep. not going to see SEO results for six months. Yep. Like there's a disconnect in the cause and effect right. chain there. Right, right. And so- Because they you know, see it as screaming into the void. Um, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and with, right. your, with offline stuff, I mean, I'll pound the monthly newsletter, a marketing tactic all day long. Yep. But aside from that- and maybe writing a book, things like that. There's not a whole lot of offline content marketing per se. When we talk about content marketing, it's primarily online. And creating all that content, it's a job. Like it's work. I mean, you have an entire team of people, several people. That's all they do. Yep. That's right. Well, and I I put my hands to all of it too. I put my hands to it too still. Yes. And I've got 20 employees because it matters that it's done right. Um, Correct. Yeah. Even though there's a time lag between input and output. Yeah. Yeah. Right. No, I still have to do it. I love this. Okay. So we don't have a ton more time, but give me a couple more. I, we could talk for a long time. I mean, I'm just not Joe Rogan and I, you know, I haven't budgeted three hours for this conversation, but I think we could probably go for three to six hours on these topics because that's how you roll. And I'd love to have you back on the regular as much as you're willing. Can, can I drop one more from the book before we go? I would, that's what I'm asking. I want cool. you to drop your kind of your favorite one besides the one that made me mad. Besides that one? Besides the one that you like to poke me with. Besides that one? Yeah. Um, leveraging besides the one that I'm, I'm still holding a grudge about. Leveraging professional relationships. Okay. Talk so we you. talked earlier about being a specialist, either in the service that you offer or the niche industry or profession that you primarily serve. Okay. You should, as a practitioner, be relying, and this, again, this is, maybe it is connected because it's offline, but you should be networking with other professionals. I'm talking lawyers, financial planners, real estate agents, mortgage brokers, other financial, you know, broad financial industry people and legal industry people, because they all know people, their clients that need tax help. One easy way to do that is put them on your email list and send them great content on the regular. And that way you can be touching them in a soft way on the regular. And, but to do that, you have to kind of give an intro and like get their permission, Mm -hmm. so to speak, Mm -hmm. and have a relationship. So it doesn't feel like you're just slapping your crap at them. Like you have to be like, Hey, John, you run an estate planning firm. We could probably do a lot of stuff together. I'm just going to give you a flavor of what sort of things I do in our, you know, in our firm, you mind if I kind of add you to our distribution list or what have you, so you can see what I'm writing to my clients. Cause I'd love to do some work together at some point. That's it. That's yeah. a great way to approach it. Um, and this is something where I think it's valuable. Some may disagree with me, but face-to-face meetings. Oh yeah. No, I love that. Go grab, grab coffee, grab a <clears throat> beer, whatever with these attorneys, these real estate agents, these mortgage brokers, these financial planners get face to face, you know, yeah. as this isn't just a COVID thing and we're all coming out of our shells. Well, it's and even better go gorilla. And if it's like a really good lighthouse style business in your industry or your local market area, bring cookies to the office. Like just like do the Jay Abraham, like gorilla marketing mm-hmm. style stuff to get your foot in the door and build that relationship. And that's an amazing way. It's, it requires a little bit of H-U-S-T-L-E and like 
that's kind of a dirty word for a lot of people, myself included. Not really, but well, hey, you know, I'm, it, I'm retired now, so I'm a professional slacker at this point. Right, right, right. You are. <laughs> um, you're living off, you know, sale of your various companies. But yeah, man, I mean, th this is great stuff. And I love that you are like still in the game, still kind of putting out great content. You know, even though you don't have like some of the same kind of things that you're doing, you are still out there. And I'm very thankful for that. I love your voice. People can find you at jasonbowman.com and specifically the book. Is it on Amazon or are you selling it just on your website? Yeah, it's on Amazon. Okay. Along um, with so a dozen other books I've written. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but this is the one that you want. Profit Optimizers, 12 Big Ideas for a More Profitable Tax Firm. You can find it also at jasonbowman.com slash books. That's Jason, J-A-S-S-E-N, which is fun and different. Uh, it's not J-A-S-O-N. It's Jason. Jason Bowman. What's the ethnic background on? The story there is just that my mother was in pain after I came out and just spelled it whatever was top oh, of her mind. So it's not like a Dutch nope. or like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Everybody thinks it's like, you know, Nordic or, yeah. or, or Danish or something like that. Yeah. No, no. I, I will tell you one fun fact. I recently <laughs> learned that in Swedish, my name means jacket. Oh, well, hey. Yeah. Yeah. Because obviously. Because obviously. Right. So just call, just call me the jacket guy. You're the jacket. You're the jacket. That's like a superhero <laughs> name. I love it. The jacket. Yeah. Jacket. Jason jacket. Bowman, the jacket. Um, yeah. All right. So everybody, go on over to his website. We'll put the link in the show notes and on the website for this episode. So Jason, before you go, give me one big, like, takeaway of this year, one prophetic pronouncement for the industry as somebody who's been around the block, seeing a lot of cycles, what do you predict for 2023 busy season and where like maybe that and, or like big trend that you're tracking? Well, I mean, that's, that's a two-parter for me. It is, every, yep. Everybody knows I come from the resolution world and I made this pronouncement back in 2020 when the pandemic started with all the measures that were going on. Oh. I was telling everybody in two or three years, we're going to see this there huge is a storm surge ruined. Yeah. in resolution work. Okay. People Especially, are not going to pay their idols. People are not going to pay their PPPs. Correct. Well, yeah. and it's also the big thing is the breakup of payments of payroll tax deposits right. from, from 2020. And ERC shops. And, yeah, ERC screwing stuff, it all up. Yes. And, yep. Yes. And yep. so in 2023, actually, it's already started. But mm -hmm. in 2023, you're going to see a lot more 941 tax resolution. There's going to be this whole wave. Oh. Why? Because businesses are going to miss their December 31st, 2022 mm -hmm. final installment payment on their 2020. 941 mm -hmm. obligations. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's a huge one in the resolution side. So I would be remiss if I didn't say that. Mm -hmm. That's short-term trend though. Like, go ahead. Shut so up, on, on the tax prep side, again, I know you don't want to be doom and gloom on the podcast, Oh man! but if you have not started the process of transitioning your tax practice into other, either other revenue streams or providing tax prep for specific niched industries and professions where you can charge a higher price, you're already behind the eight ball. Yep. Okay. You have like, it, as every year goes on, this becomes more and more important. And so I'm not gonna stop hammering about this. The robots are already here. They're already eating into your income. Mm -hmm. uh, we're already seeing that in the prepare our data, you know, issued by the IRS. It's already happening. Okay. Right. It started a few years ago. And so as you start to lose ground on some of your clients that you don't have as solid of a long-term relationship with, they're going to go elsewhere. And so you've got to be doing things to, to offer additional value-added services so that you can get them to stay and also to obviously increase your revenue per client. Like you, you've got to be focusing on how the change in the, just the general tax prep landscape and the industry as a whole as it goes towards more automation, how you're going to survive. What are you going to do? Okay. Yep. You need to be proactive about this, not reactive five years from now when you're suddenly like, whoa, where did all my like basic 1040 work go? Because <laughs> that's, right. that's what's going to happen. Yep. I love it. 
that's that's um, my mini rant. I mean, it's uh, that's what I've been saying, and I think it's for sure true. There is there are exceptions to that, of course, but yeah, right. Uh, and you know what? A lot of people just rolled their eyes. Yeah. When I said that. Well, okay. it's kind of like diversify or die is coming. So um, I, yeah, that's you know what? Yep. That's that's a much better way of putting it. <laughs> yep. All right. Well, thank you, Jason. Again, jasonbowman.com, the new book, Profit Optimizers, 12 Big Ideas for a More Profitable Tax Firm. Thanks again, buddy. Thank you so much, Nate. Always a pleasure to speak with you.